Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's the end of September, and normally this time of year, we would be talking about an upcoming NHL season. But here we are talking about the 2020 NHL draft, the 58th NHL draft in history. And what a weird one this is going to be, don't you think, Matt? Yeah, well, we're recording during Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals in September. And, you know, we always talk about the preseason Stanley Cup champions, and now this time it's actually going to happen. This is usually where we'd be talking about the last game of the preseason, or actually by this time probably it would be final roster cuts. Yeah, true enough, and figuring out the last, you know, and looking at Edmonton and all their fans getting excited because they won all the preseason games, and just to fall flat on their face in a week's time, and and us you trying know, to figure the, out the which normal. one of our walk-on guys to to sign. Yeah. But, inst- but instead, we're gathered here today to talk about the NHL draft. And if you think about this, Matt, this, would you agree that this is probably the draft in modern history that's been the most underscouted? I mean, we had no IHF under 18. The CHL playoffs were canceled. The college playoffs were canceled. The Central Scouting Combine was canceled. Like, where you want to see your players, which is in those stress situations... We haven't had any of those, so I think there's probably less data than usual on these players. Yeah, and for that reason, I think that you might see a few guys that normally would be, like, rated in the third round who would have had a good playoff in that and or end of season and would have risen up into the last end of the first round or in the second round those guys so like there's a greater opportunity with more picks down the line to get additional high quality assets potentially and i think probably more than usual you'll see players who are sort of rated between let's say 70 and 120 probably moving more than we'd usually see because i think with teams not seeing those guys as much with Maybe some of the European players not being scouted because even in January, February, I know some teams weren't trying to send scouts over there. Um, I think it might be more of a a gut instinct than it is scouting and video on these guys. Mm-hmm. Well, like it, it's sort of like what uh, we usually do in our breakdowns of uh, the various prospects for our show where we're just watching video of them or like our memory from watching like the world juniors and stuff like that and extrapolating that hey this guy might actually be good or yeah not so much (laughs) i really don't want to think about some of the flames scouts sitting home with no pants on watching video and picking players well that's the world that covid has brought Well, with that in mind, let's talk about the picks the Flames have. The Flames have, for the first time in as long as I can remember, a uh, pick in every round. Not always their pick, but a pick in every round, at least as of right now, about a week and a half away from the draft. Uh, the Flames have their pick in round one, which is the 19th overall pick. They have the 50th pick in round two, which this is going to be weird because there is no 49th pick. So technically it's the uh, 49th pick because Phoenix had – or. Arizona had to forfeit their pick, so I don't know how we go 49 just having no pick. But anyway, uh, 50th pick in, in the second round. The third round is where it gets dicey. This is the pick that we still don't know what we have here. Let me read you these conditions. The Oilers have yet to announce whether they will give their 2020 or 2021 third round pick to the Flames as part of the James Neal trade. If they give up their 2020 choice, the Blackhawks will get pick number 76 this year as part of the Gustafson trade. If the Oilers give up their 2021 pick, then the Blackhawks will get uh, pick 81 from the Flames for the Gustafson trade. So, uh, yeah, no wonder they don't want to do conditional picks in the new CBA. This is getting very confusing. Got to crack out the lawyers just to figure out (laughs) all the technicalities now. I was saying to Matt, if I was an NHL GM, I'd be making a trade. Like, if it rains four times before September 1st in Calgary, I get your fourth. If not... I get your fifth. They're like, you know, there's reasons that they're not doing the same or so either way, we probably won't have a pick in that round. Um, 
uh, we you know, get... and if it was me, like honestly, I'd be signing contracts where, like, instead of it being like seven million dollars, it'd be like seven million one hundred and twenty-six thousand, and like go right down to like thirty-two cents, just because. What if you made? What if you made that a bonus that you'll get a thirty-two cent bonus if you can correctly tie your your skates for game one? <laughs> Yeah, a, a whole incentive laden thing of just absurd things for or like a quarter. Or if you sign, if you sign the deal with thirty seven cents, then you say if we make it through round one, we will round up to the nearest dollar. If we don't, we round down to the nearest dollar. Yeah. <laughs> Choice is yours. <laughs> Zach Ronaldo, choice is yours. Guy is not going to play much. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> In the, in the fourth round, the Flames have pick 96. This is actually San Jose's pick, and it's weird. You might say we didn't trade with San Jose. We got the pick from Buffalo for Frolik. I think this pick got moved four times. Yeah, uh, wasn't that pick... traded like uh, from like San Jose to Montreal to Buffalo to us? Yeah, something like that. I can, I can take a look for you here, but uh, this is a pick that's been well-traveled. So it was first... Uh... Let's see. Yeah, so it was San Jose traded to Montreal. Montreal traded to the Sabres. The Sabres traded to us. And for all we know, with knowing what Tree does, we might not own it come uh, pick 96. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. And, and knowing the that, have- if we do actually keep it, that player will be a superstar. And, like, all the other teams will be like, God damn it, we traded that pick. We could have had that player. God damn it. <laughs> Or, you know, it'd be funny if that guy then gets traded from us to Buffalo, from Buffalo to Montreal, and from Montreal to San Jose in his career. Yeah. So you know, it goes back reverse, to being San Jose's yep. player. Yeah. Just as he's peaking. Yep. Um, and then we have our picks in rounds 5, 6, and 7. So that's picks 145, 174, and 205. So really seven picks in seven rounds. This is a lot different than what we've seen in the past three years. In the past three drafts, the Flames have only made 15 picks. So, I mean, if we can make seven picks this year, which we'll talk about later if we think that's going to happen or not, um, that's quite substantial for a Flames draft. It's been a long time since we've seen the Flames walk away with a lot of picks. And, and to the Flames' more. credit, uh, with the limited amount of picks that they've had over the last three drafts, they've had a lot of really excellent selections with their draft picks, even in the later rounds, getting guys like uh, Pedersen, Zavgarovny, Wolf. Uh, that look like legitimate actual prospects instead of just, oh, yeah, that's that guy that we drafted in the seventh round in that one year. Yeah, I'd say those mid-rounds, rounds four, five, six, the Flames are getting a lot of good guys, but I don't think there's any real high-end for sure talent there. I mean, I think a lot of those guys will be in the NHL, but I don't think you're looking at any of those guys to be the heir apparent to Goudreau. No. No. Or Kachuk. You need the young, cheap guys, especially in a flat cap era that we're in. But, you know, and that's what rounds four, five, and six are for. Yeah. But we're missing that high-end talent uh, coming out of the draft. Yep. Well, with that in mind, Matt, before we get into every player uh, that we want to talk about here, what do you think the Flames need to target? If you're the GM of this team, you're sitting at uh, at the South Dome talking to your scouts who may or may not have pants on on the video call, and... You're saying, we want to target this type of player. What type of player is that for you going into this draft? Well, every once in a while, there's a draft that's bizarrely weighted in one direction. And in 2008, it was a very defenseman-heavy draft. And, you know, that was the year that the Flames decided to draft a forward and got Greg Nemitz and then Mitch Wall. And for some reason... Quality picks. Yeah, for some reason... Then when they actually def- drafted a defenseman, they got T.J. Brody in the fourth round. You know, and, like, my opinion has always been that, like, if there is a group of players that seem to be more accentuated in a draft, go with that. Just because the fact that even a- as you're going through the draft, those guys, you're more likely to hit an unsung guy th- on that position than uh you would normally like a tj brody and this year's draft seems to be exceptionally forward heavy which is unfortunate for the flames because they need defensemen but the amount of higher quality 
forwards, like some of the guys that are going to be available at 19 in other years would be the guys that you'd be looking at at 8 to 10 in the draft. And with that in mind, do you think maybe there's a strategy to take a defenseman early, knowing there's still going to be lots of forwards on the board come uh, pick 50? Well, the thing is, is that the defensemen that are expected to go in this first round, like, they kind of look more like their upside's going to be, like, a good 3-4 defenseman if they hit, whereas some of the guys uh, up front look like they might be a top six forward, might even be a first liner, potentially. And it's one of those things that, like, yes, we don't have a good group of defensemen coming through the system. But on the other hand, you know, like we can always use a good forward and make a trade for a defenseman or, you know, free agency is a thing. Petrangelo would be a nice addition. Um, you know, you can find another way to address the problem for the short term. It's just that like with this year's draft, you know, you're not going to get a guy at 19 nor like you would this year under normal circumstances you'd probably have to be picking at like 11 12 uh under normal circumstances so the flames could benefit significantly just from uh taking going that yeah going that route because uh schneider and ghoul uh who are the guys that are rated around where the flames are picking like they're okay, but they're not. You're talking good about defensive. defensemen specifically. Yeah, yeah. Those okay. are the two main guys. Like they're just they're they're not like just awesome. Like where you'd be like like a Valimaki. Like you know the like that pick was like a oh he could be a really good defenseman. Like those and two I, I guys think are one benefit though the Flames might have there is they don't need this guy to step up right away, so they can I think maybe take a guy who's more raw talent and season him a little bit more than maybe they might uh, in other drafts. True. But I just think that the upside on the overall is higher with the forwards by a good margin. I think the Flames, if we look at the areas they need to draft, we won't talk about actual free agents or NHL players, but I think the defensive cupboards are bare. And whether you're drafting those guys, you're making a trade that's bringing in prospects, I think they need to find a way to get some young defensemen in the system. I mean, uh, we had a good number of guys when we talked to Stockton's finest during the season who were on defense in Stockton that were just on AHL deals and we probably won't see again. Um, you know, I think maybe Connor Mackey's ready to step into the HL, but we're really, we don't have a lot of guys in that pipeline. So whether they come later in the draft, I think you will see the Flames. Oh probably... yeah. Like the second and third round, I would fully expect, uh, and the fourth, fifth, like I would expect two, maybe three defensemen in those rounds. It's just, especially in the first round, it's the forwards just seem to be on a different tier. Well, let's talk about some of those forwards. We'll go through this uh, position by position. These are guys that Matt and myself have put together. Most of them Matt put together. Credit to him. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about each one of these players and a little bit about what we can expect from them. So let's start with the centers. And the first guy on the list who is rated kind of from all the major rating sites, pretty much average number 19, a Calgary boy himself. Uh, he's 19-year-old Dylan Holloway, who plays for the University of Wisconsin. He's six foot one, 203 pounds. He center left wing and a left shot. And some of the things, if you read the Elite Prospects Draft Guide, they say Holloway consistently applies pressure on the back check, pickpockets puck carriers, makes timely hits, wields a disruptive stick, you name it. He never flees the zone early and is capable of an e and is a capable east-west attacker who shields the puck from opposing defenders. What do you think about Holloway, Matt? Uh, a lot of his game reminds me of what Michael Backlund is now, and a very good two-way center. Um, I don't see the offensive upside, so, like, you're looking at, like, a good third-line center who could po possibly emerge as a second-line center, and, like, that's a very useful player, and, like, if the Flames decide to go that route, that would be an excellent pick. Um, 
not necessarily the biggest need for the Flames at the moment, but it wouldn't hurt. He has a good size to him. You know, and getting smart defensive players helps at any point in the draft. And I think if you look at former Flames first-round picks, they're sort of playing that second, third, sort of two-way role. I mean, we've got, as you mentioned, Backlund, we've got Bennett. Like, the Flames aren't necessarily shy to take their top-line play or their top picks and put them into that kind of role. I think Holloway has a high upside. I just don't know if he'll ever get to that upside. Yeah, and like things would have to break in the right way for him to emerge as more than like even a second line center. I think not only break, but I think he would need to be Holloway's a guy that I think I wouldn't want to rush to the NHL. He's a guy that I think needs some AHL seasoning when he's ready. Um, he is 19, so he'd probably finish off his NCAA, put him in the NHL. Like I think he's the long path, if you want to go that way, to the NHL. Yeah. And even then, I think a lot of it's going to depend on who he plays with. Yeah. He, I don't see him being the guy who creates the offense, but I think he can facilitate things well. It, much in the way that the... Backlund does. Like Backlund doesn't do a lot all by himself. But, you know, you stick him with Kachuk and he'll put up 50 points. And I think because Holloway is an NCAA player and because he's on that long track to the NHL, by the time you see Backlund starting to decline a little bit, um, maybe by the time, you know, Bennett is moved out of town eventually, uh, maybe that's when Holloway's ready to come in the lineup. So maybe he would be filling a need three, four, five years down the line. Yeah, I could see that. And it would make some sense. Uh, the next guy on the list, another centerman. This one fans might have seen if they've watched the Hitmen play. He played for Kamloops of the WHL. And this is Connor Zari, uh, 19-year-old from Saskatoon, six foot, 181 pounds. He's a left-shot centerman. He's rated, depending on where you're looking, uh, Craig Button rated him 19th. Uh, Central Scouting has him at 15th. And some people, Elite Prospects, has him as low as 25. So just reading a little bit of Elite Prospects guide again here. It's Zari's shot that leads the way. He's a deceptive trigger man, one with an excellent shot placement, a deceptive release, and the ability to fire two-touch missiles on a moment's notice. His ability to collect difficult passes is a real difference maker. He doesn't often break stride to receive passes either, maintaining the pace of his team's attack. What do you think about Zari? Uh... I don't particularly like Zari. Um, he, just like my impression from watching him, is like the guy, like the one name that jumps to mind is Hunter Shinkarik, where certain skills that are really good, but just the whole package, there's just something off. And like, I don't know, like, I, I don't see him actually translating to the NHL. Um, you think it, he's going to be one of those? And we see one or two of them every year. The guy that's a junior star, he got A6 points this year, but barely makes it out of the AHL. Yeah, like I, I could see him making the NHL. I just don't see him put, reaching the potential that, you know, like you see 86 points and think, oh, well, that guy must be a middle six or top six player. But I just... It, it it's hard to quantify because like it's like his passing is okay his shot is okay he's not a it, he does not great at making passes but i found he's good at receiving weird passes yeah and it's one of those things like if his release was better in terms of placement of shots like he has a really good shot it's just like getting the puck off of his stick like everything just it seems just a little tiny bit off and it usually when that happens from previous drafts usually that player has a hard time clicking over as they move along in their career i think too with a 32nd team coming next year there's going to be obviously more jobs zari's the kind of guy i can see sticking around the league for a while because everybody thinks they can fix him. I hate to compare him to this guy, but a guy like a Pavel Brendel. Brendel was with how many teams? Because everybody thought they could get something out of the junior star. Yeah. And I can see that being Zari, the guy, like you said, who maybe doesn't live up to his junior potential, but everybody brings him in because, well, the kid's got a shot. If only we could teach him to be more on the the mark, that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's 
uh, like the modern version of that would be Shin Carrick, and that's exactly yeah. I think the he's got a higher thought. upside than Shin Carrick, though. Yeah, I do too. I think he can it, be an NHL regular. I just don't think he'll be a top six NHL regular. Yeah, I agree. I wouldn't call Shin Carrick an NHL regular. No, a part timer, and yeah, that was yeah. It. Uh, the next guy, probably the best name in the draft, or at least the best first name. Do you remember when we when we brought in what was his name, D'Artagnan, a couple years ago? Yeah, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan Jolie. Jolie. Yeah. And this guy's got probably the best name, Maverick Bork, and Maverick spelled M-A-V-R-I-K. Um, that's a that's a pretty sweet name. Maverick Bork plays for Schwinnigan of the QMJHL. Uh, he's 18, uh, Quebec from Quebec himself, 5'11", 185 pounds, right shot centerman. Rated everywhere from 12th by elite prospects all the way down to about 22nd by central scouting. So a guy who is all over the place. He's known for his hockey IQ. A lot of people say he's got really good IQ. He knows how to make the plays that no one else sees. Um, But a bit of a... I mean, 5'11 is not a smaller guy in Flames parlance, but not as big as the last guys. And... Um, he, he, he's good at luring defensemen out of the passing lane, but I'm not sure he's got that high end offense that we need. What do you think of, of this I think player? he's very flashy and like, I don't see him translating to the NHL as a center. I think he'll be a right winger, uh, more just due to his size. And I think that, uh, he's quick on his feet. And I think that, uh, being a winger would utilize that a little better, um, I think he has the potential to be an electric player if he's in the right situation, and I I would actually rate him as one of the top players from the middle ra- of the first round and would be probably second or third on my list for realistic guys for the Flames to pick. From what I've seen from Bork, and I haven't seen a lot of them, but... Um, from what I'm seeing with him, he looks like one of those guys who could probably be a really good player on a bottom team and probably your second or third line guy. Like you said, he's dynamic. I could see him, you know, being the top player, say, in Ottawa or Detroit. But when you trade him to a Calgary and Edmonton and San Jose, getting lost in the middle of those teams. You think that's kind of a fair assessment of his skill level? Yeah, and we could use that, though. And, like, him being a natural right shot and... and probable right winger you know it's one of those like the flames need right wingers and it would be a good fit i just Um, think he might get snapped up before us because oh yeah i do too i'm not expecting him to reach but if he does he's probably second or third on my list okay that makes sense yeah, I'm. I'm. I just. I think someone's gonna snap him up, not just because of his cool name, but I think he is dynamic, like you said, and I think some team will take the flyer on him if he's available. He's definitely worth looking at, but honestly, I don't think he's gonna make it to 19. Uh, yeah, honestly, this is the player that I expect the Edmonton Oilers to draft. Yeah, you expect them to draft Maverick. Yep. Interesting. Not a defenseman again. You expect yep. him to go with another forward, another center, no less. Yeah. Okay. That's what they're known for. Can't break the the tradition. Yep. Uh, well, let's look at some wingers now. So those are all the centers that we we're going to look at. Um, the next guy that we'll take a look at is the first non-North uh, American-born player, Noel Gunler from Sweden. He's 18, 6'2", 174 pounds, plays right and left wing, but he's a right shot. So he'd probably end up as a right winger here in Calgary. Um Again, the Elite Prospects Guide says Gunler creates the majority of his offense with off-the-puck skating patterns, the ability to find space, and relatively good timing. He's got a great shot, and if someone can carry the puck into the offensive zone or dig it out on retrievals for him, watch out. He's able to tag anywhere on the net with time and space. This guy's also the first player we've looked at to play in a men's league. He played in the SHL last year and got 13 points. What are your thoughts on, uh, on Gunler, Matt? He's a very good quality offensive player. Um, I think he's going to be more trending towards being a top six forward. Uh, if the Flames drafted him, like that wouldn't be a bad selection. Uh, I have a few players that I, I just prefer to him, but he, he checks all the marks. He's tall enough, uh, has decent offensive skills, good shot. There's not really a lot to complain about 
um, he, he does everything well. And, you know, that's pretty much what you need. And I think you get better stats looking at a guy instead of get a guy getting 81 points in the uh, in the WHL or the QMJHL. I think when you see a guy playing in the SHL in Sweden with men, you get a better idea of who this player is going to be points wise in the NHL. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, plus uh, being in the SHL, like like I remember uh, Matthias Janmark uh, when he was in his first draft year. And he had zero points in his draft year. And yet he's emerged as a high quality middle six player for the Dallas Stars. And, uh, you know, with Gundler getting 13, even though that doesn't sound like a lot, that's actually pretty good for his age. So, you know, it's interesting. We'll see. Uh, if Gunler's... the Flames, if he, the Flames select Gundler, like that. You know, there's not really much to complain about. Gundler's rated, depending on who you look at, as high as 18 by ISS and 45 by Craig Button. I could see a scenario where Gundler's still available at 50. I think there's other guys here, especially defensemen, that could jump ahead of him. Um, And I could see the Flames potentially getting him with their second pick. I wouldn't hold out for it, but I could see him falling... I think partly because he's... I think one of the benefits is he's in Europe and he'll have a place to play next year. But I think um, I could see this guy falling a little bit and maybe the Flames getting him in the second is a bit of a steal. All right, the next player we're going to look at is a, is another centerman. He's played a little bit of wing this year, depending on uh, some of the video you watch, but more on center. He, he played in two different leagues. I think he was... If I remember correctly, he played uh, wing in the International Juniors and center most of the year in the MHL. But, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. And this is Murat Kuznudinov. I don't know how to say his last name. He's one of these Russian guys with the the unpronounceable last name. Yeah, uh, who's not Denov? <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so we'll just uh, call him Murat. Yeah. He's an 18 year old left shot center, five foot nine, hundred and sixty five pounds. Again, played in the MHL in Russia, um, and actually, yeah, in the MHL and got thirty eight points. What do you know about this player, Matt? I just think that he has a good amount of upside. Uh, I would expect him to be a second or third round selection for the Flames if they go that route. Um, just a lot of skill there and quite electric and enough where. You know, it might be worth taking a flyer on him. He's rated, depending on where you look, between 51 or 41 and 53. Um, I don't think he goes... I wouldn't use the first on him. I think we have enough small guys as well that if he's available in round two, maybe. But I'm just thinking we have players like this in the system. I'd rather take a defenseman in round two. Yeah. I can see that. It, it's just one of those... You toss it up and see... It just and Russian, on who, yeah, Russian players sometimes fall too. I mean, he could fall to round, round. Well, I guess we don't really have a third round, so he's not going to fall to round four. But uh, yeah, he, he could fall further than. I mean, Calgary might be able to trade down in the second and still get him if they wanted to. Yeah, well, and the thing is, is that uh, it's just like Nikolayev last year could have been like a late first rounder if the flame or if uh, he was a Canadian born player, and yet the Flames got him in the third round, so. It's entirely possible that he could even be available by the time the fourth round comes about, but we'll see. Yeah, and we'll see. We may have a third. Depends on this whole... I don't know why Edmonton gets to tell us what they want to do so late, but whatever. Yeah, he could be available third or fourth round. The next player we're going to look at is another Canadian-born player from Winnipeg. Uh, played for the Portland Winterhawks last year, and this is Seth Jarvis. He's a right shot, right winger, 5'10", 172 pounds, 18 years old. Um, he's ranked anywhere from 13th to 29th based on the rankings you're looking at. And he had a, a good season with the Winterhawks, uh, 58 games, 42 goals, 56 assists for 98 total points, which is pretty impressive in the dub. What do you think about uh, Jarvis? A very good, short, electric player. Um, He reminds me a lot of Clayton Keller. Uh, He's not as uh, shifty as Keller. He's more of a direct offensive talent instead of more of a cerebral guy like Keller. But 
Uh, if this wasn't quite as deep of a draft, I could see him going in the top 10. And uh, if he is available at 19, like it, it would be hard to go in a different direction. He Do you has think he that, will be, though? I, I seriously doubt it. Me too. One of the things I like about him is he seems like he can pass as well as he can shoot. Yeah, uh, he's just an all-around talented offensive player. I don't see how he gets past, like, 13 or 14. But if for some reason he's at 19, it would be hard to announce another name than his. Is he the kind of talent you would trade up for? No. No, I don't think so either. Well, let's look at another right winger, right shot, and this is Jack Quinn, who played for the Ottawa 67s last year from uh, Cobden, Ontario, 19 years old, 5'11", 176 pounds, right shot, right winger, ranked everywhere from 16th, or actually 10th, all the way down to about 16th in uh, or 20th, I guess, by some of the scouts. Uh, he's played for Ottawa last year, 89 points in 62 games, 52 goals, 37 assists, what do you what do you think about uh, Jack Quinn? He and Jarvis are very similar overall. Um, Quinn's not quite as dynamic as Jarvis, but it's close. It's like a half point difference between the two. But Quinn's also taller than Jarvis. I I think that interchangeably, either one of them would be a very good pick. Do you think Quinn makes it to nineteen? Similar to Jarvis, like I can see, like if you're say picking at 15, I could see teams going, well, if Jarvis is taken, we'll take Quinn. If Quinn's taken, we'll take Jarvis and have them. From what I've seen of the guys, Jarvis is the better passer, but he seems to have he seems to have more. Uh, Quinn seems to have more patience with the puck. Jarvis is a good passer, but he seems to want to get the puck off quickly. Where Quinn seems like he'll take the extra step, take the extra look. That seems to be, to me, be the biggest difference in their games. Yeah. But yeah, I don't see either of these guys uh, making it to nineteen. There's always one guy who falls in a, you know, surprisingly, and I think that Quinn and Jarvis could be top six forwards, but I don't think we're going to see them fall to nineteen. Yeah, it would be a bonus if either of them did. Next guy is yet another right shot right winger. There seems to be a ton of them out there, but we can't get our hands on any of them. Another Canadian, 18-year-old, uh, Dawson Mercer, who played in the QMJHL, six foot, 179 pound, right winger, right shot. He played uh, in the Q last year and got only 18 points. Well, I guess 18 with one team, 42 with another. So we're looking just over 60 points for this guy. What are your thoughts on uh, on Mercer? He's taller than either Quinn or Jarvis, and so he's more likely to translate to the NHL uh, because of that. Uh, but he's not quite as fast or quite as skilled as either of those two. But again, it's very close. And I think that like if he makes the NHL, he'll be more of a second-line guy than a first-line guy, where Quinn or Jarvis could emerge as a first-liner. A decent overall pick wouldn't be my first selection, uh, but he, like Bork, would be second or third. From what I saw of Mercer doing some research, he's good at deking. He's good at getting himself open in front of the net. He's not always the best at getting it in the net, but I think he's a guy that can create space in the offensive zone if that translates to the NHL, and I think there's value in that. Um, I think he could fall to 19. But like you, I'm not sure he's the guy I would take at 19 if some of the other guys are on the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think he will fall to 19, but of the guys we've talked about, I think he's the most likely to do so. Yep. And now we're going to talk about the guy that I would really like the Flames to select. This is this is Matt's favorite player of the group. This is uh, Sarnia Sting's uh, right winger, right shot from Montreal, Jacob Perot. And Matt, you've noted that he's the second generation NHLer. Who's his dad? Yannick Perot, the guy who played with Toronto and Montreal and bounced around here, there, and everywhere. Perot's really, from what I've seen, a pure sniper. He's got one of the best shots probably in the draft. It's accurate and it's hard, and he can score from anywhere. Yeah, he's also extremely fast, scored over 40 goals this season, and he just played on an absolutely terrible team. 
and I think that his draft ranking, uh, from what I've seen, is in the mid twenties. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's impacted by the fact that he played on a really lousy Sarnia team, and I just, for me, like seeing his shot, his speed, like his whole package that he brings like i think that he has the highest uh, talent of all of the players that we've seen in in this group and i think he has the most electric play and could be the most impactful of all of the players his highest ranking from the kind of experts if you will is 20 23 by elite prospects and future considerations goes all the way down to number 40 by craig button at tsn um, his colleague at TSN, McKenzie, ranks him in the 21. So a guy who's kind of ranked by most people in the mid-20s. Is this a guy that you would maybe take out of order if he's available? If he's at 19, unless you had basically like Jarvis or like one of the like the goalie. A surprising fall. Yeah. Then, it, like if not them, then I would go with Perot. I think that he has the most talent of pretty much anybody on the list. So you you would actually draft him. And this might be the kind of guy, too, where, and and we know the tree's good at this, you drop two spots and still get your guy. Yeah, and I could see that, too. You know, maybe they drop from from 19th to 21st, pick up a fourth, and still get their man. mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, with his bloodlines, you know, you would be more likely to see him make the nhl and you know i just i don't see a downside with because he is a very fast player and like that is one of the things that the flames lack a lot is the speed game and i think with his ability to shoot the puck i could see him riding shotgun on gaudreau's line or kachuk's line down the road and I think, and, and we'll talk more about this later, I don't think any player in this draft outside of maybe the top three are going to have an NHL spot this year just because I don't no. think we'll see the AHL play. So this is not a guy you see even on the fourth line this year. This is a player that I think is two, three years away. Yeah, I agree. And I think that uh, with uh, Perot, it also creates the uh, it amusing uh, thing for the announcers where you have Jake Jacob Peltier last year and Jacob Perot, and so you know, throw them both on a line. And well, isn't one with a K and this one's with a C? So you have Jacob with a K and Jacob with a C. Yep. We just need to find somebody in the middle, and we can have a triple J line of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob, and I don't know James. We'll bring Neil back, or oh, we'll, no. we'll find somebody. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, let's move on from the forwards. Those are probably the guys we're most likely to take, as Matt said, just based on where they're ranked. Um, but I think, personally, the Flames need defensemen this year. And we talked about I think they need to take a lot of defensemen, maybe late. But there's a couple defensemen, too, here that we'll talk about that I think I wouldn't be opposed to the Flames taking early. And the first one is uh, another Canadian. Lots of Canadians this year, which is good to see. From Prince Albert, he played for Brandon Wheat Kings, 19-year-old Braden Schneider, he's a right shot defenseman, six foot two, two hundred and nine pounds. Uh, the scouting report on him is he's an absolute behemoth of a dude at this level, imposing his will with thunderous hits, overpowering powering one hand pushes and cross checks. He's composed and doesn't overdo the physicality or take needless penalties. Enters every hit with his stick leading and doesn't hit unless he can break up the play otherwise. What do you think of Schneider, Matt? Uh the player that he reminds me the most is Jack Johnson. And just a decent middle six defenseman can add a little offense plays good defensively reasonably solid all the way around okay and you know like i I like him and like if this was like a normal draft i would be all for him at 19 it's just that the forwards this year are just on a different tier like you're getting guys that will be available at 19 that normally would be like number 10 number 11 in a draft as a, if it was a normal one then schneider would be a perfectly good pick and who i'd expect if on the board 
the, the well, and, and again, there around. might be strategy here. The Flames have currently spent 14 consecutive picks without taking a D-man. Maybe there's a strategy here to trade down and still get your D-man. Yeah, I could see that. It, you know, like if yeah. they if they can get value for it, why not trade down to 23, 24 and pick up Schneider? Yeah, I could see that. Um, and that's why I wanted to put him and the next guy in here because I could see the Flames trading down to and still acquiring one of these guys. The next one is Caden Gooley. Uh, he's 18 years old from Sherwood Park, Alberta, so Edmonton territory or Oilers territory. Six foot three, 187 pounds. Played for Prince Albert this past year, and with the Raiders, he got 40 points. Uh, big man. He's a big menace. He's constantly moving his feet. He's got a lot of speed for his uh, size, too, from what I saw. But more of a, I'd say, a defensive defenseman. What's your read on Gulli? Yeah, uh, I think that like he's the lesser version of Schneider. I don't think his offensive game will translate. Uh, yeah. And that's okay. Not all defensemen need to be offensive demon. No, and it just... Uh, like I, I see him, like if he hits his potential as being a number four type defenseman like a Travis Hamanick which is fine it's just you know that, like I it, would be okay to trade down to get Schneider I wouldn't be okay to trade down to get Gooley yeah exactly like if the Flames were picking 30th then Gooley would be like one of the players at the top of the list but I also just, wouldn't feel comfortable yeah. trading up to get Gooley like trading a second up to make sure you get this player. He's not that good. I think he'll be a good defenseman, but he's not worth sort of spending the extra asset for, I don't think. Yeah, like this year's defensive crop is just kind of below average a bit. I think, like, there's just not really a lot of good defensemen this year. And Well, I think it's also hard when you've got a lot of good forwards. The defensemen they're playing with don't get shown as much because the yeah. the forwards are beating them like often when you see years where we've got really good defensemen like you said in the past we get kind of the weak forward class so i think because a lot of these guys play against each other when you yeah. got great forwards you're not going to show the defensemen as much not saying they couldn't be good they just might not have got shown the same way to scouts true uh the next guy on our list who's another defenseman another guy playing in a men's league playing for hv 71 of the shl 18 year old emil andre um, he's a five foot nine defenseman left shot and he's rated probably about 50, 51. So a guy who could be a second round pick for us, um, got one point in three games at the, uh, SHL level this year. What do you think of Andre? I think he's a very good offensive defenseman, uh, with him being five, nine. Uh, uh, he reminds me a, a lot of the same characteristics as Adam Fox when we drafted him. Uh, smart defenseman, excellent offensively. And, like, if the Flames go forward in the first round, I would expect a guy like Andre would be pick number two if on the board. Yeah, I, I think I could see, I could totally see this player with the second pick. Yeah. I think, and again, we talked a little bit about earlier, but the fact that he's under contract in Europe through this season and Europe is playing, I think could be, uh, could be a bit of a boon there as well you know you got a home for this player a couple guys i added to the list that you're not as familiar with so i can talk more about these guys justin Barron out of the halifax mooseheads from halifax 18 year old right shot defense 6'2 198 pounds um his brother morgan Barron is also a a player that some people might know and not a guy who's getting a lot of goals, Baron, but a lot of assists. He got 19 points, 15 assists, four goals. This guy, I think, is more of your stay-home defenseman. This guy reminds me of sort of a, a less offensive – I'm even trying to think who on the Flames to compare him to. Um, I'd say a less offensive Hannafin. I think Hannafin, when he wants to, can be a very good defensive defenseman. And I think if you strip away a lot of the offensive part – that's what you've gotten, Baron. He's got touches of being able to shoot. Not only score, but he can shoot and get the puck in for the forwards. But I think a guy who's more defensively responsible. Yeah, like a guy that profiles to be a 4-5-6 guy in the NHL. And you still need those. Oh, yeah, for sure. I just This is a guy not, who... Not a first-round pick in my... No, yeah. and and he's going anywhere from about 38 to 16. I think if you can get him at 50, he's a better choice than Andre. If he's available, you take him. But I I wouldn't I wouldn't move I wouldn't use the first pick on this guy. No. 
But as we know in the past, and part of the reason we're doing this, who knows what Tree's going to do? I mean, we could end up with two seconds and no first. So we kind of want to look at those guys that are in the first and second range. Yep. Um, and another guy I added from Moto Hockey, another 18-year-old, William Wallen, Wallander. Uh, he's a left shot defenseman, 6'4", 192 pounds, big boy out there, um, playing on a men's team in moto hockey. He played mostly moto under 18 and moto J20 last year, but 24 points. This guy, I don't want to compare him to Chara because he's not nearly as big, but again, a guy who I think his, his benefit is his size. He can go out there, he can move guys around, he can open up lanes, he can get guys off the puck coming into the offensive zone. Not a big offensive defenseman. I wouldn't even say a great defensive defenseman, but a big defenseman. Yeah. His game sort of reminds me of a more polished version of Derek England from what I've seen. Yeah. And, like, honestly, I think, like, if that would be more of, like, a fourth or fifth round pick. Like, I, yeah, I don't even know if he'll go that far down. I mean, he's projected by most to go in the second round. I think this is a guy that, you know, if you're a team that needs defense – um, you might snag him if some of the other guys we've talked about yeah. are off the board. Yeah. Uh, I think just, the fact he's big, someone's going to take him in two or three. Yeah, it's just... Uh, like, the problem with <coughs> guys like Baron and Wallander, to me, like, it just screams, this guy's going to bust. <laughs> well, and, I don't know if he's going to bust, but... Uh, yeah, I like, mean, it you know, just... I, I, like, that's my initial impression. Uh, you know, from, like... Anytime, like, with defensive defensemen, like, it, it's, it seems like they're more difficult to get them to actually translate into the NHL for some reason. And, like, especially lately, like, you're seeing more of the offensive guy who's able to add the defensive game translate. Uh, like, say, Rasmus Anderson, who was primarily an offensive guy when we drafted him, he re- managed to round out his game. And, uh, like, I, I think that uh, if you're lacking the whole offensive side of things, like, it just seems to be hard for those guys to translate into anything more than, like, filler replacement guys. Well, I think a benefit these guys might have in Calgary they wouldn't elsewhere. If you bring either in the AHL, they'll probably play first pair of minutes because we're so short of defensemen. True. You know, if you were to bring Barron into another HL team, he might be second, third pair, like you're saying, sort of those filler guys. But I think you could bring these guys to the HL. You could give them top minutes, and you might be able to to hit that high ceiling on both of them just because of that. Yeah, I can see that. But again, probably not where we want to use the pick. But I just want to profile them because of the Flames, and we'll talk about this in a bit, trade out of first. I could see those guys potentially being uh, some targets there. Yeah. But Matt, you got two goalies. You're actually thinking about potentially taking our first round pick on a goalie. Do you want to tell us about the Russian goaltender you're profiling? Well, uh, I doubt significantly that he'll get past 15. Even um, there are just so many teams that need a good goalie prospect, and I think Yaroslav Askarov. He's solid enough in so many respects that I think that some team will take him. I would actually kind of expect like either Buffalo or Edmonton to be taking a long look at him. Um, just a solid all around goalie prospect. Uh, he looks like he profiles to be a good NHL goalie, whether that's a starter that, or an all-star level starter or not, we'll see. But you know, he's one of the few that's actually worth a mid first round pick. Um, the other guy is a Swedish. Can we just give some stats on this guy first? Sure. Uh, 18 year old Russian player. He played, and this is one of the names I love in uh, Russia, the Avangard Omsk. That was his team they played for. He's six, three big guy in net, 175, 176 pounds, uh, catches right. And the profile in him from elite prospects is what makes him stand out is the way he utilizes a range of depth management to effectively make the most of his wide stance and fluid movements. He doesn't, he has incredible reaction speed and does a good job of controlling himself within the blue paint when he needs to. He's difficult to pull out of position by holding sustained pressure on his team's end of the ice. So, this, yeah, we'll talk about the other guy, and then I'll give you my thoughts on uh, on goalies in general in the first round. But the next guy is Ke- Kelly or Kale Klang. 
Callie Klang. Um, plays in Sweden. He's a Swedish goalie. He's 18, 6'2", 176 pounds. What do we know about Klang, Matt? Uh, he has a perfect name for a goalie because, you know, Klang is the goalie's best friend, you know, anytime the puck hits the post. Um, Klang, here's the Klang. What a great save. Exactly. And uh, I think that he's a very similar prospect type as like a Yanni Ordeo. Uh, just solid. So the guy you can't stand up properly? Uh, no, just the overall makeup. Like there's enough potential where the guy could be an NHL goalie. And he seemed to be the best of the non Askarov goalies. This year's draft for goalies is kind of on the weak side. And, and this is probably a guy you'll get late, too. Like, you don't yeah. need to spend a first or a second. This is a guy who we can get fourth, with our fourth. Fourth, fifth, sixth. Yeah, fourth, fifth, sixth, something like that. Like, there's not a lot of good goalies this year. I wouldn't be shocked, like, if the Flames do go get a goalie, that it'll be somebody completely off the board. And it's like, uh, okay, sure, that's a guy. And that's not even on the name list type of thing. Um, I think the the thing about Askarov you mentioned earlier is with, I would say, the emergence of young goaltenders this playoff, I think there's a lot of teams that want to go find a hot young goalie. And I think, like you said, As Askarov will be gone before the Flames even, like before their coffee cools when they sit down at their table. I think he's going to go somewhere between 6 and 12. I don't yeah. even think he makes it to Edmonton. Yeah. I could see, I could see uh, Buffalo taking him. I could see... Florida potentially taking them. I could see New Jersey taking them. Um, I, but yeah, I think he's going to be well off the board. And I think for the the other guy, Clang, as you mentioned, and you say this all the time, just take a goalie every year. Yeah, and it's one of those things. Like uh, goalies are such a weird thing that you just look at how many we've gone through in our system. Yeah, and like unless you've got a Kiprasov or that a tier like that you know just keep throwing picks at it and you'll eventually get one you know like you see like columbus they got lucky with both corpusalo and merlitskins you know like you can actually get good nhl goalies out of the deal you just don't need to spend a first every year but you know adding one here and there and especially with the system going to be getting a bit of turnover because i don't expect gillies to be back or schneider so we'll see yeah i mean even this year we don't know what's going on in the hl but yeah i think you'll see some turnover there i don't know how long they're going to give parsons he he hasn't really played a lot, but yeah, you're right. I think we're going to see some turnover there. And to the Flames' credit, they've done good with goaltenders. I mean, Riddick is a prime example as getting them as free agents. So even if they don't take a guy in the draft, I wouldn't be surprised to see them bring one in from somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, well, like Zagadulin last year. Zag yeah, Zagadulin, Riddick. Um, we didn't do so well with European skaters, like when we brought in Wolf Castle McBain and guys like that. Um, but we're doing well with the goaltenders. Yeah, well, hey, it just takes one to turn things around. Who is that other Russian center we brought in? Chervankov or something who didn't Roman speak Chervenka. any English when he got here? Yeah. Yeah, that that guy. Yeah. And he was actually Czech, believe it or not. So okay, just I just know he didn't in the speak KHL. English. Yeah. Um, so that kind of rounds out what we're looking at for picks. We'd love to hear who you guys want the Flames to pick. Let us know on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash fireside chat. On Twitter, we're at fireside podcast. Um, let us know who you want the Flames to take. Comment on this post on our website at firesidechat.ca. But Matt, before we wrap up, I think we need to look at a couple more things. And that's the very uh, real possibility. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, uh, how do you see the Flames drafting this year? Like, in terms of, like, positionally, just, like, through the whole draft? Seven picks. I think they take a defense. I think they're going to take a defenseman in round one if they have a first round pick. And I think you'll end up with mostly defensemen throughout the draft. Uh, I think they'll. I think you're right that there's more good forwards, but I could see them trading down and taking a defenseman. Yeah. I uh, see a first rounder being a forward, then a defenseman in round two, and then jump ball after that. I think that, like, if there's a good forward, go that route. 
I don't see there being a ton of good defensemen this year, so I, I would actually kind of expect this to be more of a forward-heavy draft once again. Uh, I guess another reason you might take a defenseman is they're going to be playing in a European league that's got a lot of guys that weren't in Europe last year. Guys are getting yeah. loaned to Europe. So you might get a defenseman to get some good seasoning this year playing against some top prospects. Yeah. Like, if I had to break it down, I'd expect four forwards, two defensemen, and a goalie. Let's say if the Flames draft at 19, I expect a forward. I don't think they'll draft at 19. I think they'll trade down, and we'll talk about that. But, yeah, okay, I'll say... I'll say three defensemen. We have, what, seven picks right now? I'll say yeah. three defensemen, uh, three forwards, and a goalie. Okay. I think they'll – I could even see them sort of defense forward, defense forward every other. But um, And I think once you get down to it, a lot of it's a flip of the coin when you're getting to defensemen in round three, four, five this year. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I could even see the Flames tossing one of their picks, like their sixth or seventh, to someone else and kind of bowing out early and saying, you know what, we'll – We'll take a pick next year instead from somebody when we have more time to scout. Mm-hmm. Well, so conversely, with that, then, uh, conversely, I could see uh, teams offering up picks like that, and the Flames might be able to snag a few extra players if they want to. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and I think that's going to be the on... weird thing about the 20, 2021 draft is if no junior clubs are playing, no one's going to get scouted next year. So, yeah, I can totally see that of teams saying, let's – Let's. I. I actually think they go the other way. Let's get a pick this year to get the certainty, because who knows what next year is going to look like. Yeah. I. I'd actually almost hope that the N. NH- like if there is no junior season at all, that the NHL just decides to scrap the draft and like just trade all of the picks down a year type of thing. So any 2021 picks that have been traded make it 2022, and just have need- it like being a super draft. We need the guy who does the monster truck voice. 2022 is the mega draft. <laughs> Everybody gets two picks in each round. Super draft, 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 draft. <laughs> I don't know if uh, we can do that. We'll see. Because there's still going to be European players and stuff that be affected by that. But maybe yeah. you do a shorter draft, like a four-round draft or a three-round draft next year. Yeah. That could be. Um, It'll or be everybody, weird. everybody could just violate the combine rules like Arizona, and then we don't have a first round. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just take away everybody's first round pick. No problem. Yep. You have all been st- found guilty, and will be forfeiting all of your draft picks. Can you imagine how weird it'd be for that guy? So, where were you picked? Uh, round two, pick one, but technically the first pick overall. What? Yay! <laughs> but anyway. Um, let's talk about the very real possibility of moving a pick because we know with tree that, uh, he'll probably, he, I won't say he probably will. There's a good likelihood he'll move a pick. So we don't, we don't want to do sort of wishy-washy. Obviously if there's a good deal, we'll take it. But for you, Matt, what would it take to move up? Is there anything you could see the flames, um, a guy, the flames really want to move up and what would you be willing to give up to move up? I don't really see the point uh me neither like if the flames want say like they want ottawa's second first round pick at number five well then just trade the, a player like goudreau for that or something you know like make a hockey deal around that pick to get whichever guy that you're actually looking at i i don't see the flames using pick 19 and something like, like there's this you know, I think they'd want whichever pick that they would get plus the pick at 19 to, like, do, like, a mini rebuild type thing. I think there's enough teams that are going to be looking to move that I think the price are going to be higher than usual to move up. And being 19, I think the highest we'd probably be able to afford is 10, and I don't see the difference at 10 to 19 this year. Yeah, and, like, the thing is is that with the high quality of players in this draft... I uh, I don't really see a point. Um, like, there's not like say like from Seth Jarvis to Jacob Peltier. There's not really, uh, or Perot, pardon me. Uh, like, there's no uh, real huge difference between either of them. Yet one's dra- uh, rated like eleventh, and the other's like twenty three. Like, it's one of those things that 
there's just not a huge difference. And, like, all of the players, basically, between those two goalposts are virtually identical. So I think if you see a top 10 pick traded, it's going to be for a team that needs to dump salary and wants to give one of those players a, a really good hockey player to get the salary off their books. And I don't think Calgary's in that position. Yeah. Um, what about trading down? Either down in the first or, let's say, out of the first and getting a second and something for our troubles. What would it take for you to do that? Uh, it would depend on... Because, like, all the GMs basically know what everybody's going to be doing uh, with their picks. Because, um, like, you don't trade down, like, if you know that, oh, the team two picks away from you is going to take the guy that you really want. Though I don't uh, know we're going to have that certainty this year, because often you see them sitting on the floor talking. They're not all going to be in the same place, so I'm not sure you're going to have the same certainty as you would in other years. Yeah, and that's why I doubt that the Flames would just trade down. I, I doubt that any team is really going to bother unless they don't really care type of thing. Like, they, they have, like, three guys that are equal, and so they don't give a, a hoot which of the three they get. And, like, the it, if reason... the Flames get to 19 and, like, say they have four guys, three or four guys that they have basically equal on their list, then I could see the Flames trading down. But I think they'll just go with the guy that they like and run with it. Because they want defensemen, and as you've said, they'll probably take defensemen in mid-rounds, I could see them trading down, let's say, from 19 to mid-20s if they can get a second or third. I think if you can get an extra pick to pick up an extra D-man, maybe not this year, but maybe even next year, I think if, if we could trade, let's say, 19th to 24th and pick up a second next year, I think that would be a worthwhile deal. Yeah, and... Or even, even uh, I guess... Even get, if uh, they were wanting to trade from, like, 19 to 24 just to pick a different forward, uh, even, and they were able to pick up, like, say, pick 45 out of the deal... Yeah. It's like, yeah, sure, because the guy at 45 is not going to be a bad player. Or like, you're there. There's enough talent in this draft where a guy like a Dylan Dubé is available in the second round. So, and like with the Flames' ability to scout and draft, if they can maneuver, like they could end up getting multiple good players out of this. By and we're sandwiched. Down. We're sandwiched picking between New Jersey. They pick 18th and 20th. Um, I could see I could see the Flames making a deal to move down a couple, but this is not the kind of deal that you do until I think New Jersey's made the pick at 18, and then you make the deal. Like I don't think you see this announced at pick 10. I think this becomes, who did New Jersey take at 18th? Who do we think New Jersey wants right after us? And then we decide, do we make that trade? I think this would be some on the floor right before the, the, the pick is made. Yeah. You know, you kind of wait and see what Chicago do, what New Jersey do, what Montreal do, and then you make that, that decision to move up or down. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think the likelihood is, and what would it take for you to trade that pick away? We've seen Tree do this a number of times recently with uh, Hamilton, with um, with uh, Hamannick. What would it take for you to move that pick for, uh, let's say, an NHL asset? It would have to be a Dougie Hamilton-type prospect. Like a guy that's an NHL defenseman that's already in the NHL and playing and looking like a decent top four defenseman. That's the only way I could see, you know, like in lieu of getting a f defenseman in the draft because the guys that are available as defensemen in the draft are kind of eh, okay. That, like, I could see them trading in effect the forward that they would pick at 19 for the good de young defenseman instead see and i'm gonna go a bit different with that i think if you want an established defenseman you can try your hand at ufa this year i think there's a few of them out there you mentioned Petrangelo earlier if i was going to trade away that pick this year i'd want an established goaltender i think there's enough of them on the market right now that you could probably get not a not a Carey Price or a Mark Andre Fleury, but you could get a decent number one, better than I think Talbot for your first and something. Yeah, and I don't you know, know like we need. It, you know, you look at Columbus with Merlitskins and Corpusalo. You could pick Merlitskins up for nineteen, 
you'd probably have they'd probably have to add a little to get 19 but you know like there it's doable at least yeah i i just think that if you want defensemen there's enough of them that'll be floating around whenever free agency starts that you could go that way i think the goalies are always in short supply and free agent goalies tend to get paid too much i think you might try to beat the goalie market and trade for one on the floor yeah i, could I wouldn't that. go for an i wouldn't go for an old guy i wouldn't go for anyone older than say 30 but I think, yeah. But, um, no, like I'd be games. talking like with the Islander or the Rangers with because uh, they have Gregoriev and Shosturkin, um, and Columbus with uh, Corpusal and Merlitskins. Like, there's a few teams that have multiple good young goalies. Get one of the good young goalies, and and that's where you it. might end up overpaying for that guy now for yeah. the payoff you'd get down the road. Like you said, I yeah. think a 19th overall for Merlitskins might be a little rich now. But it might yeah. be one of those trades you look back at in four or five years and go, wow, we only paid a first for him? Yeah. Exactly. So th- so that's the deal I could see if they're going to move the first. Um, do you see – we usually see Tree active at the deadline or leading up to the – or, sorry, active at the draft or leading up to the draft. We're about a week away from the draft as we record this. Do you see any non-top picks? So let's say first or second – really happening for the Flames, something big, not like Buddy Robinson moving, but do you see, say, a Goudreau deal happening or a Monaghan deal happening? I, how would you say, with Dallas uh, making it to the finals, uh, it looks like they're going to lose, but anyhow, um, they're, it kind of, like, it kind of rearranges, like, how the first round was. Like, it, it's not like the Flames lost to a team that just lost to a team or something like that. Like, that that team went to the finals, and the Flames look like the better team for most of the series. And so I think that changes the calculus a little bit. I don't think that the Flames are going to go into seller mode. Uh, I would be somewhat shocked if uh, Monaghan or Goudreau got dealt. And I think that we're mostly going to stand pat and i think that the, what the flames need to do is find a way to add defensemen i think that they need to add two defensemen uh but i think that's more of a free agency thing like a top three defenseman uh and then a another guy that's just like a middle ish okay like a sammy vatnan or something like that type yeah, yeah I, th- I think you can address that through UFA this year. Yeah, exactly. I'd be shocked if the Flames don't do something, even if it's just moving out some of our older forward glut. Like, I could see, you know, a Robinson or somebody like that move for a fifth or a sixth. Yeah. But I don't see I don't see the big hockey deal happening at the draft without draft picks swapping hands. Like, you might have yeah. to move, say, Goudreau and the 19th for the – eighth pick and something or you know something like that and i don't think the flames you said want to trade up so i think if a big deal happens it'll happen after the draft and i would say probably after the opening of free agency i think there's a lot of teams that want to wait and see what they can get done before they'd make a big deal Hmm. yeah and like there's a lot of uncertainty with a lot of things and like you saw like the horn quest for matheson deal uh and you know, like, there's a lot of teams that are going to be wanting to shed uh, contracts that, you know, and the Flames do have, like, $17 million in cap space, so, like, and not really a lot that they have to re-sign. So, you know, it's one of those things where, you know... Like and that's not are... a deal I would see happening on the floor. That's the kind of deal I could no. see happening as we near whenever the season starts of, hey, we need to now move this contract... We need yeah. you to do us a favor. We'll throw in a, a second or whatever. Yeah. I don't think you make those kind of deals at um, no at the draft. At least not this year. The draft. You might in previous years, but I don't know you would do it at the draft this year. Yeah. Well, especially with this year being such a bizarreness, uh, I don't really see there being any urgency to get uh, anything. Like, I, I don't see the amount of trades being overly high uh, this year just due to the fact that everything is so far up in the air. 
Yeah, I think if you see trades, and we'll talk more about this in our when we get to free agency eventually, but I think if you do see trades, they're going to be close to the start of the season. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much rounds up our NHL draft preview. Weird draft this year. It's on the 6th and 7th of October, which usually we're used to being a Friday and a Saturday. This gives us a Tuesday and a Wednesday draft. Yeah, and that's usually opening night-ish, give or take. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's not going to be like for a lot of people, they'll sit down and watch it on NHL Network on Saturday. I guess there's not going to be much to see. It's just guys, you know, on their Cisco or whoever's the NHL's uh, video conferencing sponsor. So I'd say probably less to see than usual this year. That's probably yeah, why they're doing definitely. it on Tuesday. Yeah, it's going to basically be like the coverage that you would normally get for day two is going to be perhaps and with even, some more like highlight packages thrown in the... <laughs> yeah, I would say even less than day two because I think that, um, you know, in day two, you've still got some of the guys that are there. You still have the media interviewing some guys. Like, there's going to be nobody to interview. And I think it's going to be weird to have, you know, Bob McKenzie on Skype with, you know, Lafreniere and the delay in the leg that comes from all that. Yeah. So I, I just think you're going to see it. You know what? No, I, I think it's going to be a weird draft. I don't think I'll be watching it. I'll just be watching what picks are made. Yeah. I, I, I feel the exact same way. And it'll be interesting to see. I'm hopeful that the Flames can get another... With their uh, scouting ability and like the last few drafts being very good for the Flames and this draft being rather deep ish for forwards especially i think that the flames could walk away with uh, two or three really good prospects again this year so hopefully that works out well and we didn't touch on this but i think the big thing that you know people aren't looking at this year too is where do these prospects play next year if you're taking a guy from the qmjhl if the chl is not playing next year what are you going to do with that guy and i think that there might be some I think you might see a lot of guys who are almost stalled in a way in having their in their development because they're not playing for a year. Yeah. Like you could take one of the guys we talked about and if they're sitting on the bench, I don't know how well they're going to to do, so I think you almost have to find a place whether it's Europe or somewhere for some of these young players to play who normally wouldn't go over there. Yeah. I agree. So I don't know what that looks like, but I'm sure I'm sure the NHL will figure something out. It's just it's something we've never had to think about before. I know. Gotta love the new world we're in. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much does it for today. Unless there's anything else you want to chat about. Uh, yeah, that that's about it. Um, like there's a couple of housekeeping things, like uh, Jeff Ward got named full time coach and Kirkland got re-signed today. But uh, yeah. That, that. Well, let's talk let's talk about those in our next episode we'll do a yeah. post draft episode at some point and talk about whatever free agency looks like this year at the same time excellent so we can we can discuss some of those because i think some of those are more of a build-up to free agency than anything else uh. um, but yeah i mean you're right the coach is back really no change there he's already been the coach it's official kirkland's not going to make any impact this year um has no bearing on the draft but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do a news roundup when we come back. Yep. And I think we'll have some more contracts signed by then, too. Oh, for sure. I mean, we're still waiting to see if we're going to qualify Jankowski, for example. Yeah. Oh, here's a question for you. Do you think the Oilers qualify Anath Asiu? He's going to get yes. $3 million, and yes. he played terribly. Yeah, but he came in at, uh, he came in at the deadline... He didn't have a lot of time for the shutdown. I don't think you can judge him on that play. Yeah. He played for a Detroit team who he probably didn't need to play as hard as he normally would. I think you I think he's a guy that's easily tradable if he's not doing what you want in Edmonton. Uh. But we'll we'll see what happens there. Before we leave, I want to remind everybody to take our listener survey. Um, every we usually I'm used to saying the summer, so you might catch me saying summer. 
Every off season, we do a listener survey. This is your chance to tell us what you like about the show, what you don't like, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of. And Matt and I are going to take this forward as we look towards whenever the new season starts and try to make the show better for you guys because that's why we're doing it. So go to firesidechat.ca slash survey. Fill out that listener survey. It takes about five minutes. If you don't want to give us your information, you don't have to. But on the last part of the survey, if you give us your name and email address, um, we will enter you into a prize pack drawing. And there's some stuff in there. We have some fireside chat beer koozies. We have some flame stuff. I think we've got a hat and a banner. I have one of the retro third jerseys with the Calgary script that will be thrown in there. So if you want to be entered in our prize pack, um, it's always a mystery fireside chat and flame stuff. Fill in your name, and one lucky person will win. And we've done this uh, all the way back since 2015. So we have, what, one, two, three, four, five winners so far. So you can be the sixth. So, Matt, I think that wraps it up for this week. Do you want to take us out as you always do? Well, as always, go Flames go. And this time, congratulations to the Tampa Bay Lightning for winning the Stanley Cup. There we go. Go Bolts. It's hard to say because they're the ones that beat us, but... Yeah, well, I wouldn't go that far, you know. It, it's amusing that, uh, you know, each of their Stanley Cup wins has an asterisk. There you go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.